Smita. Good morning, one and all. I am Ashmita, and on behalf of Department of Life Sciences, Sophia College, would love to extend a warm welcome to all who could join us today for the much anticipated talk. I would like to invite my friend Nilofa to give us a preview into today's session. Good morning, everyone. I, Nilofa Khatri, would like to welcome you all to this talk. On the behalf of IFSA Foundation and Sophia College, IFSA is an incredible organization that was formed in the year 1973 and stands to uplift the low privileged classes and women scientists. Today, Sophia College is honored to host a talk organized by the IFSA Foundation by Dr. Chitra Mishra on genome editing. Genome editing is the precise modification of the chromosome in the form of deletions, insertions, or replacement in a living organism. There are various technologies that have been developed to bring about genome editing in organisms, such as mega nucleases, zinc finger nucleases, transcription activator like effector based nucleases, also known as Stalin, and the CRISPR Cas technology. The CRISPR Cas systems are easy to engineer and apply, and therefore have taken the world by storm, leading to several advancements in therapy and biotechnology. The hows, whys, and whens of CRISPR-Cas discovery and applications will be presented today. Uh, genome editing technologies are powerful tools and therefore must be used with caution. The ethics of applying them will also be brought forth and its importance will be discussed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nalofa, for getting us started. Without any further delay, I would now like to request our principal, Dr. Sister Ananda Amrit Mahal, to address our audience. Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this event, which is organized in collaboration with IFSA and uh, supported by BRNSDE as well. As a women's college, an organization like IFSA is something that gives us much encouragement, much uh, inspiration. And I know that for our students in particular, it is, offers them a whole range of role models. Uh, it is also important that an organization like IFSA with its commitment to making science available to, on, on a broader platform to those who perhaps would otherwise not have been able to access it is such a valuable moment in the way in which our country is developing. It's so important that organizations like IFSA are con will continue to um, Stand up for what is the integrity of science and the integrity of every single human person. When I talk about integrity, I mean the value. I mean not just honesty, honesty, but the value of the whole person, which is being recognized and cherished through works of your Dr. Chitra Sitaram Mishra, I am really happy that you are you have taken the time out from your very important work as scientific officer at BARC to spend time to enlighten our students on this whole aspect of genome editing. I must tell you that I come from a background of literature and I'm saying editing, editing. And in my mind, editing is what you do when you get the proofs. And earlier than that, you do some copy editing where you correct the language. It's not very different. <laughs> <laughs> then when I was reading your abstract, I realized that, well, there are a lot of parallels. And uh, I was so happy to read the last line of your abstract because it's such a powerful tool. And it goes to, again, that core of personhood 
know, each one's personhood, the DNA uh, structures and so on. And ethics have to be taken into consideration when one is looking at them. So I'm so happy that you're going to be touching upon that aspect as well. I don't want to take up any more time, but I want to also congratulate IFSA on their 50th year of existence and to wish you all the best and another 50 and even 100 years more of such uh, valuable service to the women of our country and to our country as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Ananda. Thank you so much, ma'am. I would now like to request Ms. Tripta Tiwari, Member of Executive Committee, IFSA, to provide us with insight into IFSA. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm very happy. Ma'am, Principal, ma'am, uh, you said something about the forefathers and then you also mentioned four mothers. That was very inspiring and very nice to know that we don't even don't only remember four fathers, we remember four mothers also. <coughs> May I present the presentation? Yeah. Hello? Can you hear me? Or? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, you can. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, host has disabled participant screening share screen sharing. Ma'am, it's enabled, ma'am. Just please uh, can you just try me? Okay. Yeah. No. Hello. Hello. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm not able to present it here. I don't know. Ma'am, should I uh, share the PPT then? Uh, one second. No, no. You can see your screen, but we can't see your presentation. Yeah, you can see my screen, but you can't. I can't find. Yeah, you can see the screen. Yes. Yeah, I think it has come. Can you see the screen? Ma'am, your slides are if you very could just difficult. If you could just oh, okay, put the okay, full okay, screen okay, mode, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Now it is visible? Yes. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good morning, good morning, and welcome oh, all, okay. all participants of today's program. I would like to give a short introduction of Indian Women Scientist Association. IFSA, in short, oh. Principal Ma'am has already told so much about it. Very happy to listen. IFSA is an all India social welfare voluntary non profitable and non political organization. The picture you see in the is the building of headquarters IFSA at Washi Navi Mumbai. The logo here shows that we will soon be moving into Golden Jubilee year, and our slogan is Look Back to Move Forward. IFSA was started way back in 1973 by a group of 12 eminent scientists. And today we have moved, we have more than 2,000, uh, more than 2,100 members and 11 branches all over India from Rurki in North and Nellore in South. Main mandates of IFSA are taking science to society and women empowerment. The two arms of IFSA are community welfare and science awareness. With our various activities, we have reached to 23,000 participants in the year 2019 and 2020. Whereas in the year 2021, 2020 and 2021, we could reach to 17,000 recipients in spite of pandemic. 
and community under community welfare activities we have uh, working women hostel healthcare center computer center library ecc program scholarship under what this working women hostel in this working women hostel women come from all over india to work in bombay and they find a safe and secure place like home away from home with all the facilities and accommodation there are about 160 beds available when we look back and i am reminded that this hostel was inaugurated by mother teresa she said live simply so others may simply live and this simplicity is followed and maintained here in at our hostel as well as at our ipsa in the healthcare center here you see there are <coughs> this offers basic healthcare facilities to the hostelites and people in the locality there is a dentist and physiotherapist with a regular service to the locality people and to the hostelites in the computer center we offer variety of computer courses for all members of society young students to senior citizens many workshops were conducted during pandemic and lately we had a symposium on changing phase of digital era here this library was started in 1970 way back in 1974 and uh, the hostelites as well as the residents of washi they find the place uh, for reading room and other facilities here it is supported by the state government here ecc childhood care education that is early childhood care education we hold one year diploma for women and it is affiliated with to sndt university and minimum qualification for it is 12 standard and those who complete this uh, diploma course they easily get job in primary schools and they become independent and here for the ladies to do this course there is no age bar Here we also have some scholarship awards. Uh, these are given to the students on merit come need basis from generous donations of our well wishers. These are for the girls who pursue their career in science further. This daycare center and nursery schools are uh, closed for two years for last two years because of the pandemic. You can understand it's not safe for children. in ecc that is one year uh, diploma course of uh, early childhood care along with that we have a uh, shadow teacher training course and uh, in this shadow teacher training course a teacher gets a, a women get the training how to help the children who are not able and uh, also uh, all uh, there are also ld ad hd children that is uh, learn with learning disability and uh, with uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder such children can be helped by the parents or by the family members or by the neighbors if they do this course and in collaboration with vigyan prasad we have a shikshan setu program for primary and pre primary teachers that has six modules and this is also its modules are prepared by our early child care teachers and under school students under science activities school students are given uh, training in the school uh, tra uh, this they are taken to the library they are shown experiments science nurture they are uh, nurtured in science and maths there are lectures there are camps there are science exhibitions and many many more activities and the college students and uh, faculties also take have some popular science lectures lecture workshops and refresher courses along with all this we have a learning garden here a garden in which is thematically arranged and has more than 500 plants over here and uh, children from school and colleges they come and uh, learn from the garden activities 
and here the solar system and solar under green initiatives we have solar system and solar water heater panels which provide electricity to the ipsa and solar uh, water hot water to the hostelites now here we have some programs which are in collaboration with uh, vigyan prasad that is each one teach one uh, interesting that one college student comes and mentors a school student and it is guided by uh, it's a mentor first part was uh, conducted by uh, ves college and somaya college and we are thankful that in the second part sophia college students are also coming to help our children along with mithibai college thank you very much for that sophia college students and the faculties we also conduct uh, so we also have a science club that is known as vipnet club in collaboration with the vigyan prasar where various various varieties of experiments are conducted like robotic arm and indicators and designing parachutes and many other things and there were six garden based workshops were conducted uh, in this the topics were about like uh, seed preservation herbarium making bio fertilizers and many more so students and faculties and other people can benefit from these workshops here we have internship program under this internship program sorry yeah internship program for uh, ipsa conduct this internship program for different colleges like for khalsa college we have had for uh, sis coms nerul we have had from flame university there were students from jehan college and now the one going on is from sis college side in these internship programs uh, there are uh, some projects given to the children and there are expert lectures conducted and there are uh, final reviews taken from people from india and abroad with this and those who are very keen children do learn learn from the project they also publish some booklets about whatever they have learned like here you can see uh, mysteries of uh, mangrove forest children of jaihin college have written this book made this booklet so this benefits all the college students very much in different ways here we have three varieties of uh, school college and uh, science in our life lecture which are supported by brns board of research in nuclear sciences bae department of atomic energy government of india so government of india is supporting all these lectures and today's lecture which we are having by dr uh, chitra uh, mishra that is under this category of popular science lecture and uh, here in school also we are conducting such lectures where we bring in experts from different uh, faculties and they come and talk and science and our life lecture is up for the society so this uh, in this thing you can uh, all these lectures are on the youtube if you want to see these lectures and uh, understand more from here you can type in the youtube on the bar that if so complete if so i w not only i w s a complete if so that indian women scientists association youtube lectures and there you can read please see them understand like it and subscribe it and uh, this is uh, three newsletters every year we publish in this all the activities are shown to the uh, about uh, if so activities and these uh, newsletters are sent to the members in mail and e copy is sent to all that those who are interested can see into it and lastly not to go beyond let uh, take more time at uh, you can visit if so website that is and those who are interested in becoming mem member they can uh, take the screenshot of this slide and uh, join see the website 
and uh, if the headquarter mail id is here you can uh, join ifsa and send your particulars on the mail so our efforts are towards knowledge sharing and bringing about a change leading to value creation and promoting innovation with emphasis on science based methods so thank you everyone please join enhance ifsa's digital effort for contribution and your contribution will be appreciated thank you very much for giving a patient case thank you all thank you ma'am just a reminder to all participant please put up your queries in the chat box on zoom or youtube and they will be addressed accordingly i would now like to invite dr suzan epen former president and board of trustees ifsa to introduce our guest speaker for the day dr chitra sitaram mishra thank you asmita good morning it gives me immense pleasure to introduce my former colleague dr chitra sitaram mishra currently scientific officer applied genomics section baba atomic research center mumbai after doing her bsc in microbiology from bangalore university and msc in biotechnology from mysore university she did a one year orientation course in baba atomic research center training school in 2003 to 4 and joined brc as a scientific officer later chitra did her phd from homi baba national institute mumbai her research interests vary from crispr biology and its applications in gene silencing and genome editing particularly in microbes another main interest is diagnosis of infectious and non infectious diseases using crispr cas9 and other cutting edge technology she is also interested in biotechnological applications of genetically engineered bacteria her research experience vary from development of crispr based genome editing and silencing tools for microbes then genetic engineering of heavy metal sequestering or precipitating for bioremediation she is also involved in a phosphatase mediated bioremediation by metal precipitation using genetically engineered microbes when the pandemic struck in 2020 she was involved in standardization and improvement of crispr based covid detection kit prior to joining baba atomic research center mumbai she has done two projects one on serotonin receptors at national center of our biological sciences bangalore and also another project on characterization of hemoglobin variants using mass spectrometry in a indian institute of science bangalore she has been awarded department of atomic energy group achievement award for genetic manipulation of bacteria for eco friendly applications in agriculture and environmental clean up in the year 2012 she was awarded outstanding doctoral thesis award in life sciences awarded on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of homi baba national institute in the year 2015 she also won the best post award at the 16th annual conference of indian nuclear society insact in 
which was organized at uh, Mumbai. She has uh, eight international publications to her credit and uh, two others. She has attended several workshops and presented papers in uh, several symposia. She has also guided many MSc students. Now I am really proud to invite my student in a BRC training school, Dr. Chitra Sidara Misra, to speak on genome editing. Dr. Chitra, please. Uh, Susan, ma'am, thank you so much for that fond and kind introduction. Uh, we really look forward to your, uh, I mean, we really look upon your lectures with a lot of fondness. Uh, so thanks for that. And thank you uh, for inviting me to this uh, lecture. Uh, I didn't realize it was the 50th anniversary of IFSA. So congratulations, IFSA. And uh, again, thanks for this chance to be here today. Uh, also, uh, thanks to Sister Ananda, um, Tripta ma'am, and also she and uh, faculty uh, at the uh, Sophia College for inviting me and having me here. So um, it, it's, it's a great moment for me. So thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, so we will start with the talk now. And um, uh, please let me know if you can see this. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, yes. Yeah, and you can see the slide, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, um, so I'm going to try and uh, do my best to do justice to this really vast uh, topic on genome editing. Um, I, I understand that this is a mixed crowd. Uh, they're going to be people from hardcore biology. They're going to be students and they're going to be uh, non-biologists. So it, it's, I've tried my best to um, uh, cater to the audience that uh, that's going to be there and listening to this talk today. And this is how the uh, presentation is structured. We're going to learn about what is genome editing? Um, how can you do genome editing? What are the technologies available? What are the things you can achieve by doing genome editing? And uh, just one minute, yeah. And and uh, and and of course, the ethics of genome editing, as Sister Anda had also pointed out, that it's it's really important to do this, uh, to to take this very very seriously and uh, do it to do, do genome editing with a certain degree of uh, responsibility, right? Uh, so let's start with definitions. Uh, so what is genome editing? or genome engineering, as it is also called. Uh, sorry? Uh, is there a query? Continue with some other Yeah, voice. fine. Yeah, sure, sure. OK, so, so genome editing or ge genome engineering is the use of biotechnological techniques to make changes to specific DNA sequences in the genome of a living organism. So basically you have a very, very large genome in most organisms and you just want to do a very, very specific change in this very large genome. And that is the challenge of genome editing. I'll, I'll explain this a little more in detail in maybe the next slide, but to sort of uh, get some things out of the way, uh, is this genetic engineering? Yes, it is genetic engineering. Uh, is genome editing different from genetically modified organism? And there is a lot of controversy and this is a very, very gray area. But typically when you say genome editing, you mean a very small change or a, you know, considering the size of the genome, you're just making a change in a very, very specific area. But when you say genetically modified organism, you generally mean that a foreign gene has been introduced or there are several copies of a genome that of, of a gene or genetic material that doesn't really belong to that particular organism. It's basically a foreign gene altogether. But different people look upon it differently. For some people, genome edited and GMO practically are bunched together and, and one is as bad or as good as the other. But some, some, some people make a distinction and that there is a very clear difference between the two. And we'll come back to this a little later when we are talking about ethics. So just to put things in perspective, um, so, so this is 
you know, this is what a human cell looks like. Yeah. So this is what a human cell will look like, right? And the genetic material of this cell will be organized in the form of chromosomes. So there is all this, uh, you know, all these colored things, they are the chromosomes. And we all know that the human cell has about 23 chromosomes and uh, they are in pairs. So you have 46 chromosomes. And if you count the number, okay, so, so this is what the chromosome looks like. And if you zoom in a little more, you'll find that a certain chromosome will look like this. And this is made up of what is called the DNA. <coughs> and the DNA is a double helix, which looks like this. <coughs> and if you zoom in further, you will find that the DNA is made up of just four components or bases as they are called. and that they are present in a certain sequence. And this entire genome, as it is uh, known as, is composed of several, several genes, each of which makes a protein. And how much protein and what kind of protein is made in a human body is what determines what that, that, that in a human body or any organism for that matter, is what determines what that organism is going to be like, right? So, which is why genome is so important. So if you look in further, you, you find that there are these bases and the sequence in which these bases occur is what defines uh, how that, that particular organism is going to be like. So there is this GCT and it's all a combination of these, these bases that occur. Now, remember, so, so in, a human, in, a, in, in, a, in a certain uh, human cell, you'll have 3 billion base pairs, okay? And now you want to make a change in maybe about 10 bases or 10 base pairs as they're called. And that is the challenge of genome editing, right? So it's like a needle in the haystack. It's really like looking for a needle in the haystack. And you have to be able to look for this particular sequence, say, in this huge haystack and be able to make your change here. And that is the challenge of genome editing. Uh, and you can already see that this is a very, very, very difficult thing to do. Uh, and the only way I can distinguish this portion, say, for example, this portion in the gene from the rest of the chromosome is by this sequence. So I should, I must know that this sequence is what I want to change. And this must be unique and occurring only in one region for me to change it. Otherwise, I'll change the other region also. And the only way I can tell this sequence, this region apart from the rest of the genome is by its sequence, right? And just like, just like, uh, just like anything that you want to change, if you want to change anything, if you want to change uh, something made out of Lego, you got to break it before you can actually put it back together. Just like that. If you want to change anything in a gene or a genome, you have to first break it, right? So you have to introduce a break in the sequence before you can actually start doing what you want to do with it. And um, so, so, so the problem of genome editing gets reduced to just being able to recognize a certain portion that you want to make the change and make a double a, a cut there. And then remember that DNA is made up of two strands so when you make a cut here, it's called a double-stranded break. And you need to be able to make a double-stranded break before you can actually go about changing it to what you want to change it. So I hope this is the essence of genome editing, and I, I hope I have been able to convey that. So uh, fine, we made, this, we made this cut. We had a double-stranded DNA, we cut it. Thank God, now the cell can repair its own DNA. And the rest of what you need to change will be partially done by that cell all by itself, right? So how does that happen? Once there is a cut in the DNA, the cell has the ability to repair its own DNA. And there are two ways in which it can do this. Uh, also, before I go to that, when we say genome editing, we might want to do several things in the genome. We might want to just shut down a gene. We don't, we, because we, we feel that it's not making the right kind of protein or not the right protein. Sometimes we want to make a correction. We just want to change something in the gene so that maybe a bad gene can be changed to a good gene. Now, one way to shut down a gene is by just 
uh, making a very small insertion or deletion, just introducing a few extra bases here. So that what is called the triplet codon, the, there is a frame shift mutation, which means that now because of this uh, extra bases, which could be added in the form of these red things here, the rest of the protein is not made properly, which sort of shuts down the protein production. And that is that will be done if a certain pathway of DNA repair, which is called non-homologous end joining, that comes into play. So if this gets activated, you are likely to end up with what are called small insertions or deletions, maybe one or two bases. And this is likely to disrupt the frame of the protein and therefore you don't get a functional protein. And these are slightly easier to make because it's not a very, very, it's not very precise uh, a sort of editing. It's just that you have ensured that something does not get made. On the other hand, you might just want to change something. You might want to uh, change the black portion to this green or blue portion, which means that you might want to say correct a certain gene. <clears throat> and there you need to provide the correct gene. So the, the, you've broken the DNA into two, I mean, a, a, as a, in a certain place. And now you want to, you need to provide the correct copy of that particular area so that that gets integrated into the genome. And that is done by another repair pathway, which is called uh, homology directed repair pathway, right? Uh, and now these, the, the gene stands corrected. And these are called insertions uh, or corrections. So, so uh, therefore now the problem of genome editing is that of making a clean cut at exactly the place you want. And now allowing the repair machinery of that cell to take over to do the rest of the changes, either a insertion or deletion or a correction of the gene. Right. So we've already said this, the, the, the method for introducing a precise break, the prerequisite for that is you need, is, is, this is a prerequisite for targeted genome editing to make a precise cut. Now there are several, several ways in which you can cut DNA. And people have been trying genome editing for, for a very long time. Actually, I put it as a decade long goal, but I think it's, it's a two decade long goal. And uh, earlier what people would do was, um, for example, use UV or chemical carcinogens, which can break DNA. But we, we know that UV and chemical carcinogens will break DNA anywhere. You have no control over where the damage or where the break occurs. When you don't have that control, you don't call it genome editing. Uh, there were molecules which were called solarins, which intercalate into DNA. And they also, and, and once they are there, for example, here, they, once they are here somewhere, when you shine UV on it, they cut the DNA. This is fine, but again, we have no control over where the DNA is cut. And people were really smart to be able to program solarins to cut in a particular place. They conjugated the solarin to a certain oligo in such a way that the oligo went and formed a triple helix with a double stranded DNA. So what this oligo gave it was some amount of specificity this oligo would go and bind only to a region of the DNA which had that particular sequence which you want to edit, right? And it was called a triple helix. And it was, it was maybe the first attempt at targeted genome editing. But uh, yeah, so while we're on the topic, I mean, if at all any of you is thinking that uh, when we do genetic engineering and for those of us who have done that, we use enzymes called restriction endonucleases, which cut the DNA very precisely, right? Uh, and we do this, maybe uh, we, we take a 3000 basis long DNA and we use a restriction enzyme to cut it. And it works fine. It gives you a specific cut. But, the prop, but, but you can well imagine that we cannot do this in genomes because genomes are really large. Restriction endonucleases typically will recognize six to seven base pairs of, uh, of DNA. And in a large genome, the likelihood that this occurs in multiple places is very, very large. So you want to make one cut. You don't want to make several of these. But what homing endonucleases give you is a sort of restriction endonuclease, which has a rather large recognition site. 
uh, and what they do is they basically they're selfish gene elements and they have the ability to recognize a rather large recognition site on the other alley remember i said that uh, there are two chromosomes <clears throat> the two pairs of uh, each chromosome in the cell so if one pair has the homing endonuclease and the other pair doesn't it will recognize a certain area it will cut that area and it will copy itself into the other alley and so this is all right this is great but i don't want to cut the dna where there is a recognition site i want a protein that will cut that will recognize my sequence and cut it there so therefore everything that we've spoken about so far every effort in genome editing so far was not programmable you could not cut the genome where i wanted it to be cut the the enzyme just had its own recognition site and it cut it there and it's your luck that maybe that is exactly where you wanted to make a change and that is when the zinc finger nucleases came into picture and this was a real breakthrough moment <clears throat> so what we could do with zinc finger nuclease is the following zinc finger nuclease are essentially engineered proteins all right they have a dna binding domain which means that this is the region that will recognize that okay this is the dna i need to cut this is the sequence i need to cut and then there is a dna cleavage domain so the dna binding domain tells the protein this is where we bind and this is where therefore the cut happens right and how these zinc finger nucleases are is that there are these small domains you can see that there are these three domains here each will recognize a certain triplet base pair so this is recognizing ggg this is recognizing gtd and so on and you just put them together and put them put in a non specific dna uh cutting enzyme and wherever the zinc dna binding domain sits this enzyme will cut it right and therefore now you had a way to make a protein which will cut the dna where you wanted it to be cut and that and therefore this was a huge huge achievement that first time you had a protein which could be made to cut the dna where you wanted to but there was a problem with this the problem was that the specificities of individual zinc fingers can overlap and they they largely depend on the context of the surrounding so it's not it's like a genetic code which has some redundancy some overlap therefore you could not say that okay you this thing finger better bind to ggg and nothing else depending on the context it could bind something else also so you spent all this time and effort making a zinc finger domain on certain principles but when you finally check it you see that it's not working so well so it required a lot of engineering of protein and it required validation but this was moderately successful and people use it even till today a similar thing broke upon into the scene of genome editing and that is <clears throat> talens talens also work along same principles these are again proteins which have a very conserved area and then they have a they have two amino acids which are very divergent so for example if you look at this stretch uh the 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 and the protein looks like this this is the nucleus domain right and this blue thing is the dna molecule and the protein sits on the dna like this and depending on what two amino acids on the protein are present this particular <clears throat> protein will recognize a certain sequence so for example you can see in this in this particular figure that wherever there's a ht it recognizes a c wherever there's an ng it recognizes a d and so on and so therefore here again you could build modules you could make small modules each one recognizing a certain base and you can put them together and uh, you could fuse it to uh, a non specific nucleus like fok1 and it would work fine so again this is very similar to zfn except that you didn't have the problem of redundancy and once you made a talent there was a reasonable confidence that it would recognize the sequence from which you made it originally so again so far so the the from from not being able to make a protein that will cut your dna we have come to being able to make a protein which will cut the dna i want to cut with some difficulty because protein engineering is not easy and that is what the crispr system solved 
we're going to be spending a little bit of amount a little bit of time on this slide so that we understand this really uh, really really well but essentially when we say crispr we are talking about a certain area or what is called locus in biology on a prokaryotic cell so this is a, when we say prokaryotic cell we mean we actually mean just bacteria uh and this is a bacterial cell and this is the genome this is the dna of this organism and several bacteria have a region which is called crispr let's not get into the full form and other aspects of it but enough to say that this is what it looks like there are these regions these black things here there are these uh regions called repeats which are invariable they just repeat themselves as the word says uh and then there are regions in between the repeats and these are called spaces let's see how this whole system works now bacteria are often infected by phages phages are essentially viruses which infect bacteria right and they actually look like this this is not just um an exaggeration of what those viruses look like this is what a bacteriophage will look like so suppose and phages infect bacteria they kill bacteria essentially so bacteria over years have developed their own uh, system of warding off infections by bacteria so when the phage uh, warding off infections by the phages so when the phage attacks typically what it will do is it will insert its dna into the cell when the dna comes in and suppose for some reason and this this particular guy is really lucky he escapes the infection doesn't die but then they have the, the bacteria has this system by which a portion of the bacteriophage dna is taken and it is integrated into this crispr locus so it just makes a copy and puts it into its genome in this particular place now typically what happens the dna is converted into rna it's by a process called transcription so this is an rna molecule it's called a pre crispr rna molecule but it gets processed and you get an rna molecule which has a repeat <clears throat> and then it has a very small piece here which remember came from the phage dna and this is an rna molecule which which can uh, associate with the dna molecule by watson crick base pairing or what's called um, complementarity this particular rna now will associate with the protein called cas proteins which are again found on the genome are coded by the genome and this forms what is called as a ribonucleoprotein complex basically these are surveillance complex they are like guards in the cell the guard goes around the cell looking for any bacteriophage which is going to come again and attack it so now for example it had this green portion from a green bacteriophage and when it sees that dna again and suppose the rna is able to recognize it the moment this recognition occurs the crispr pro the cas protein degrades the incoming bacteriophage mm -hmm. such that now this this phage cannot cause an infection anymore mm -hmm. so what the cell did was when the phage attacked first it made a memory of that phage and now when it attacked again it used that memory to kill it and that is why it's called an adaptive immune system and this 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 really shook the world this was a huge huge discovery uh and um what 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 it allows you to do is now if you give it an rna molecule which is complementary to a dna molecule that you want to target then the moment that dna is seen by this rna and this protein it will be cut and that's exactly what we wanted to do we wanted to have a system by which we could cut a dna and the system to recognize a dna now is to just make an rna molecule instead of engineering an entire protein which is much 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 more difficult right so let's just go through the history of crispr which is really i mean crispr uh, history of genome editing actually which is really really interesting uh so in 1987 so as early as 1987 people had seen that these elements occur on these the, the crispr locus that that we spoke about here that occurs in the bacterial genome in 1985 1991 that's the reach that's the time when zinc finger proteins actually started gaining popularity and coming into picture in 2005 2006 people started to look at the crispr locus a little more carefully they found that the spaces all had sequences from viruses 
So a hypothesis started to form that why would a bacteria keep viral sequences in its genome? And they thought that maybe there, there, is, a, there is an angle of adaptive immunity to it. In 2007, it was discovered that yes, experimentally it was proven that yes, in fact, CRISPR-Cas is a bacterial immune system. And how they did it is an interesting story. There was a yogurt making company, I think it was called Anisco, and they were using bacteria to make yogurt. And phage infections are a real nuisance in dairy factory in, in places where yogurt is made because it kills the bacteria which makes the yogurt. And they had two populations of bacteria. One the population which was killed was susceptible, was susceptible or could be killed by the virus. And one population which did not get killed by the virus or it was resistant to the virus. And they looked and looked and they couldn't find any difference between these two populations. They didn't know why one was resistant and one was susceptible. But when they looked at the genome, they sequenced the genome and they looked at the genome, they found that the resistant population had just one extra spacer in the genome in that CRISPR locus. And that spacer was had the viral signature. And when they removed that spacer, this became susceptible. And when they put that spacer in the one which did not have resistance to the virus, that became resistant. So th this is the first proof that CRISPR-Cas is a bacterial immune system. In 2010, it was shown that how is it an immune system by cutting the DNA. So it cuts the target DNA. And in 2011, uh, the pyo streptococcus pyogens um, CRISPR system, which the, the protein is called Cas9, and it was found that at least for Cas9, you only need the Cas gene to function or just one protein, just one protein is enough to give it a uh, defense function. And in 2012, it was said, it, it, it was known and it was proven beyond doubt that this is an RNA guided DNA endonuclease. So the RNA tells the uh, enzyme where to cut and yet the, the enzyme cut, cuts it there. Therefore, it's an RNA guided DNA endonuclease. And you can see in this entire timeline also that talents came out in about 2009-2010. So a fairly parallel development for talent and CRISPR. Uh, and then, of course, in 2013, January, uh, the first human cells were engineered. And, and then it's just, it's just been, uh, uh, it's it just gone at, at, at exponential speed. A lot of, lot of work is being done in CRISPR-based genome editing. Uh, so just a quick recap, and this is what the Cas9 protein, and, and the reason the Cas9 protein is, so so one thing to remember is that uh, CRISPR systems are found in many, many bacteria, and they, they're being discovered, new CRISPR systems are being discovered every day. And the Cas9 protein from Streptococcus biogens is one of the one, one of the first ones to be discovered and was the one on which Jennifer Doudna, who is a Nobel Prize winner, also worked on. And that is why Cas9 is the most popular genome editing tool. A lot, of, lot is known about it already. And this is what the protein will look like. The orange and the brown is the DNA that you want to edit. The RNA is provided like that. And once the RNA pairs up with the DNA and recognizes that this is where I want to make the cut, the Cas9 cuts it there. And then we have already spoken about non-homologous end joining and uh, homology directed repair. So, you may make a small insertion or deletion, or you may have a huge repair system. Uh, so while uh, so while CRISPR systems are most popular for their ability to do any sort of genome editing, uh, there are a lot of other things that you can do with the CRISPR-Cas system. Remember that it's not just that it will cut at a precise location. The protein also binds very tightly at a precise location. Right. So this is what the Cas9 protein looks like. And if you take away the ability, if you, if you just mutate two regions in the Cas9 protein, you get what is called a de-Cas9 or a dead Cas9. You know what a dead Cas9 means is that it can't cut anymore. But what it can do is it can bind DNA very tightly. Now, changes in DNA are not just about cutting. Changes in DNA can be about not allowing something, some other protein to bind not uh, or uh, increasing the expression of a certain gene. So you can have the dead Cas9 bound to a region which regulates the protein expression, which is called a promoter. And now because this, this, this Cas9 is sitting there, the protein can't be made. So you've shut down the protein without making a cut, which is called silencing. 
or you could uh, you can fuse this to uh, something that will fluoresce and now wherever the dna is bound you will have fluorescence in those regions and now you have a way of looking at dna or you can uh, fuse something which will activate gene expression and wherever you have this uh, binding you will have increased protein expression you could also have i mean if if uh, this this epigenetic modification right so it's not just the sequence of the dna which is important what is also important is uh what are called methylation patterns on the dna so you could have a gene being shut off because there's a methylation pattern on that gene and that methylation pattern can be brought about in that region by using a cas9 which is fused to methylases so there is a whole range of applications of the crispr cas system and though and though we have this, this talk about this talk is about genome editing i think i thought i should uh, let you know that there are a lot more things that you can do uh so primarily you can make dna deletions you can make insertions you can replace dna you can modify dna you can label dna you can uh target the rna and um in the, we'll come to the applications in a, in a little bit so if you if you just grossly compare the zinc finger nucleases the talens and the crispr uh we know that the mode of action is by protein dna recognition for zinc finger nucleases and talens for crispr it is rna dna uh the assembly and design is difficult for zinc finger nucleases it's doable but difficult in talens and crispr it's easy success rate of nuclease design is low in zinc finger nucleases high in talen and high in crispr uh and then high throughput targeting is difficult in zinc finger nucleases it's it's fairly uh it's doable but it's again limited in talens and it's very very easy in crispr so so if you really look at where crispr Uh, wins is because on these two fronts it's easy to do and it's possible to do high throughput targeting and these are the two things that make it very very popular again i've already told you that there are a lot of types of crispr cas proteins and though though you've spoken about cas9 d cas9 other things there are other other uh, crispr uh, systems which which may or may not i mean some some will recognize dna some will recognize rna some will cut dna some will cut rna and depending on what you want to do you have an entire toolkit to choose from so there's right now we uh, crispr cas12 a and cas13 a these are two proteins which are being uh, extensively used for crispr based diagnostics because they have what is called collateral cleavage which which is i think outside the purview of this all right so now let's come to the applications of genome editing right uh an important thing that you can do with genome editing is you can build research models for disease uh we'll come back to this a little later but it's it's something like you you know that this particular mutation may be causing a disease but you have no way of checking it so you cause that mutation in a petri dish with cells or you cause that mutation in mice and now you have a you have modeled that disease you have a uh you have a system in which you have mimicked a certain disease and now you can try your treatment modalities in that in that background so building research models is is a very very important application of crispr based editing the other part is therapy you know you can treat genetic diseases uh you can treat cancers hiv you can even treat diseases i mean there is an entire uh, research line on how you can use crispr cas as antimicrobial agent so if you have a bacteria which is resistant to a drug no matter how much of antibiotic you're giving it's not dying you can have crispr targeted to the dna of that organism and you can send it in and that bacteria can be killed by that but the therapy the biggest problem is how do you deliver it inside living cells and and that is in fact the bottleneck for any genome uh, based therapy but but with crispr that the, the rate at which the research on delivery uh, has uh, you know is is happening has has really accelerated <clears throat> and of course engineering livestock and plants for better traits this could be higher yield this could be better nutritional value it could be longer shelf life in plants it could be disease and drought resistance we will come to all of these individually gene drive this is another technology which is which which is all which was around all the time but it was, it was difficult to do but with crispr cas it became it became really really easy and we'll come to details of that in a little bit and then of course uh, synthetic biology and metabolic engineering so you can engineer bacteria in yeasts 
which are workhorses of uh, biotechnology to produce better products. You can have cell lines that have been extensively modified to mimic a certain disease as well uh, when you're trying to study host pathogen interactions and such things. So let's come to each of these uh, individually. But before that, I think we, we, we let, let's look at how you can do genome editing in humans, right? So when you talk of genome editing, you, you have two lines of uh, two ways in which you can do it. Or uh, one is somatic gene editing, which means that uh, just a certain... Uh, I mean, a person is treated. So they target genes in specific types of cells. So you could take blood cells, change them. Uh, but in germline, you do the modification in one cell and it gets passed on to all the cells. So it gets um, goes to the next generation as well. Uh, when you do somatic gene editing, the editing gene is contained only in the target cell type, right? So if you're just doing it in blood cells, it's likely that it will only be there in the blood cell and not the other cells. But in germline editing, all the cells will have that edited gene. <clears throat> when you talk about the risks, uh, Whatever it is, the risks are limited to the person, to that particular individual in whom you've done the genome editing. But in germline gene editing, you have essentially put the entire future generation uh, coming from that particular individual into risk. So the consensus is that somatic cell therapies have been researched and tested for more than 20 years and are highly regulated and they can be done. But human germline editing is new. And there are a lot of legal and societal considerations when you want to do any sort of uh, germline gene editing. Um, maybe I should skip to... All right, fine. So, uh, I, so, so basically, I wanted to bring to you that when you want to do genome editing, you can do it in the somatic cells, you can do it in the germline cells, and both have ethical considerations, which we'll come to in, in, in a little while. But when you want to deliver CRISPR-Cas systems into cells, there are a lot of ways you can do it. Um, when you're talking about cell cultures or even mice microinjections, there are physical and chemical methods such as microinjection, electroporation, and then there are uh, lentiviral particles, and then there are nanoparticles, uh, lipofectamine, and other things. But remember, at least this entire thing, all these are limited to uh, cell cultures or mice, you cannot really use them very effectively when you want to inject them for therapy into an individual. But yeah, the adenoviral vectors, those have been explored extensively for therapy and for uh, delivering uh, agents which will bring about genome editing. Uh, and then when you talk about applications of CRISPR-Cas9, really, there are... <clears throat> Uh, in, in terms of human health or medical, uh, in, the, in the medical field, there are clearly two defined areas. One is experimental research, wherein you understand a disease better using CRISPR-Cas9. And then the other is the human therapeutics. So if you look at experimental research, like we've already said, you can make a certain change which you know causes cancer or you know causes some other disease in a petri dish, in cells. And then you can do genomic studies with this. Right. Uh, or you can generate these disease models in mice and do a number of studies. You could look at how uh, a certain kind of cancer, which is caused by a certain mutation, is best treated with what drug and those kind of studies you can do. So CRISPR-Cas9 helps you make that change in DNA, which causes a disease. And now you, have, you can study. You can have you can look at large screens. Uh, essentially, like we've already said, CRISPR-Cas9 allows you to have a lot of high throughput techniques. So it allows you to um, do uh, very large screens, which means that you don't, for example, if you have a drug and you don't know how that drug acts or how that drug uh, uh, brings about therapeutic uh, changes, then you can uh, build an entire library of mutations using the CRISPR-Cas9 system and then screen the drugs against this. And then you can find that which is the target really and work on it further. That is as far as experimental research is concerned. But when it comes to actual human therapy, you would want to change a mutation which causes a hereditary disease, for example, which is really hard to do, but we'll come to how it's already done. You could want, you might want to excise the HIV which is inside, uh, which has been integrated into the genome by using human therapeutics. 
then immune therapies and this is this is a this is again a re, uh, an area in which crispr cas9 is being used a lot wherein uh, suppose t cells are being used for cancer therapy uh, it's difficult to build up a large volume of uh, a large number of t cells from the patient himself so instead allogenic t cells are introduced and to prevent an antigenic response from the patient the allo the hla and the tcr and allogenic t cells are removed so that now it does not appear as an antigen and that is being done by crispr cas9 systems so though it seems like it still seems like a far fetched possibility you actually have companies which have already cropped up uh, these are snapshots i'll be showing you about three the snapshots of web pages of three companies this is a company which is called crispr therapeutics and they they say that they treat or they try to treat uh, problems uh, with the with the blood disorders which are called hemoglobinopathies like sickle cell anemia etc they treat they say they treat in you know oncology and they're also into regenerative medicine this is another company it's called uh, editas medicine all right and and this actually uh, shows you this is i i like this because they actually show you um how, what what is the progress they have on treating any of these diseases whether it whether it, it is at an experimental stage or early stage or late clinical stage so you can see they say they can treat retinitis pigmentosa they can uh, treat neurological diseases sickle cell diseases and uh, oncology etc so this is another such company it's called editas medicines this is intelia therapeutics which is founded by jennifer dudna and they again this is a snapshot from their website and they say they can have what is called in vivo crispr therapy that is where wherein they are actually putting the crispr cas9 into the individual to make the change and the ex vivo wherein you remove the cells you make the change and you put it back uh it, it, despite the feeling that you might be getting from these companies that this is something that's being done routinely remember that all these companies are still doing or uh, or or uh, Uh, offering therapies only as an experimental uh, on an experimental basis and this is not regular hospital uh, available therapies just to give you an idea of how fast things have progressed in this region in this area of crispr cas9 um so one of the things that are very easy to treat by genome editing is uh, blood disorder right uh, there is a disease which you all, all all must have heard of which is the sickle cell disease wherein uh, this is caused by and at least one of the mutations is uh, that that causes this uh, sickling of rbcs is called gtg this in the in the hemoglobin so the cells which make blood are present in bone marrow they are called uh, hspc cells and uh, they make a wrong protein they make a beta globin gene which is not quite right and this was a proposal this was early work they said that you could edit the beta globin gene such that it changes to the right kind of uh protein it makes the right kind of protein so you remove cells you make the change and you put them back into the bone marrow and now you have healthy cells being made and this was just as a proposal and maybe done in mice but not in humans so this was just experimental work published in uh 2016 <clears throat> so this is one way you can treat sickle cell anemia you just do the correction the other way to do the correction is that we all produce hemoglobin but when we are in the fetus in the fetal stages we produce the fetal hemoglobin now as we grow up there is a protein or a, or what is called as a repressor which is made it's called bsl11a and what this protein does it is it stops the fetal it stops the gene, the the gene from making the protein so as you grow up you stop making fetal hemoglobin and you only make the regular hemoglobin and the reason for that is this protein so what they did was using cas9 they said that i will stop this protein from being made right so you do a dna you break this dna which makes this gene and you make an error prone repair so that now this protein expression is shut off it's not made now this protein is not made therefore the fetal hemoglobin is made right so production no longer blocked and sickling of red blood cells is prevented because now you have a healthy copy of hemoglobin being made and though the sickle cell uh, i mean the bad hemoglobin is being made since the good hemoglobin is also being made through the fetal 
uh, hemoglobin route, you will not have symptoms, right? So 2016 this, 2017 this, and 2020, you already had this lady called Victoria Gray, who was the first patient to be treated with the gene editing tool CRISPR for sickle cell disease. And she and this this treatment and it was this treatment wherein they blocked the BSL eleven A, which was being used. So you had you actually had converted you know from, from lab to bedside we say uh, in four years, which is which is very very short time. And they've been monitoring her, and the good news is that she's still doing very very well and does not suffer from the debilitating symptoms of uh, sickle cell disease, right? Uh, but then yes, this is important, right? Uh, what about the ethics? And at least in this case, uh, it was all done very, very, very properly with all the required consent and uh, weighing in the options and everything. Uh, in 2018, there was a summit in on genome editing. And um, while there was a lot of uh, excitement about the emerging therapies, uh, there was a very disturbing uh, announcement. And you might have heard of this. There was a Chinese researcher and he claimed that he had edited the genes of two human embryos. That uh, and that they had been brought to term. These were early days for genome editing. Uh, 2018, people were still debating about how much, you know, how uh, is it safe to edit and and how far it should be carried and such such things. So this was received. Uh, this not received well at all by the scientific community. And the, the two girls were born, and uh, they had been edited. The, the embryos had been edited in such a way that they would not contract. HIV, uh, the, the CCR, CCR5, I think it's called, that particular uh, gene had been mutated so that these, uh, the, the children born out of that will not contract AIDS. And it was thought that it was too premature to actually uh, go about editing humans. And in fact, this particular person is now serving uh, imprisonment in, in Chinese jail. Um, so, there are always pros and there are always cons. The people who are against genome editing, they say that we still do not know enough. And that is very, very true. And that you need to, you need to weigh the risks before you consider doing anything seriously. And people who are for genome editing, they say that when you have the power to cure diseases, it is unethical to not use it, which in itself is a good argu argument. But then uh, it's all a question of how, how far you would like to go with this. Uh, so right now in the U.S., genome editing is allowed on human embryos, provided they are destroyed in the se next seven days. So essentially, you cannot have genome editing people walking around, at least in the U.S. The Chinese um, government has also, I mean, the Chinese Academy of Sciences has all, also taken a similar stand, though uh, uh, the uh, rules are not stringent in China uh, as they are in the other parts of the country or other parts of the world. <clears throat> so if you talk about experimental medicine and uh, gene therapy. Uh, these are the challenges and opportunities. One thing is how do you put the, how do you deliver the CRISPR gas systems? And one, one way you can do it is you just put in the protein and you put in the RNA. In fact, that's the beauty of CRISPR gas systems. In other systems, you had to put some genetic material inside the cells for them to uh, make the change. But here you just put in a protein and RNA, both of which are short-lived compounds. So they just need to come in make a change and run. So it's called a hit, run, hit and run method. Uh, and also how now if you want to correct a gene, please remember that when we talk about substitution or uh, your homolo homology directed repair, you need to put in a DNA template, which is the correct copy of the gene for it to go in. Uh, so how do you do that? So that, that is again a problem. A big, big question with the CRISPR-Cas system is off target, uh, effects, which means that though we say that CRISPR-Cas is very specific, that the RNA guides the protein to a certain area in the genome and tells it to cut only here, it's not that stringent. It's after all a protein and it is given to uh, having affinities to other areas. Um, the RNA may have a good match in another place where you didn't think of or where you, uh, which is very similar to the place where you designed it for. That's called an off-target double-stranded break. So uh, this is something that people are working on. Uh, they are trying to use other approaches. It's called a paired, paired Nikkei approach. They're trying to use other proteins, but this is an issue that really needs to be um, solved before uh, we can actually start using it for human therapy. Uh, 
Uh, efficiency is again a problem. <clears throat> so nothing is 100% in biology. Uh, immunogenicity, and this is a huge uh, problem that uh, Cas9 is after all a foreign protein. Uh, we do not know how the uh, hum how the immune system is going to react to it. And uh, if, if, if you people remember the uh, one of the first, uh, one of the earlier failures in genome editing was that they were using these adenoviral vectors to deliver uh, genome editing uh, proteins. And there was this person called Jesse Gelsinger who actually died because of the immune response which was launched against the adenovirus. So it was just it was just a very um, unfortunate thing and it really slowed down the pace at which research was going on <clears throat> for genome editing. So immunogenicity of Cas9 is another thing that needs to be considered. So that's as far as CRISPR-Cas applications in humans is concerned or for diseases concerned. There is this other technology which is called gene drive and you may already have uh, heard of it. Wherein <clears throat> essentially gene drive means that the inheritance of that gene is not uh, governed by the laws, by the normal laws of heredity. So normally what happens is, uh, suppose you have one bug here and one bug here, and this bug is mutated. It, it is different from this in some way. And the, it's different because of the two, of a, of a pair of chromosomes, one has some altered algae or uh, altered gene. Now, when this mates with a wild type bug, this is a, the, the ones that are shown in this fluorescent color, they are the ones who will carry the altered algae. Right? The others will all be normal. So you can see that over a period of time, this particular allele actually gets diluted in this population. But in a gene drive, you put something in the gene in such a way that it, in a few generations, it is that change which becomes dominant in this population. Okay, And how you can do that with CRISPR-Cas system is this. So you have one allele, you have, this is a pair of chromosomes, you have two alleles. You put a Cas9 on this allele, you put a gRNA or a, it's called a guide RNA. The RNA which is used to direct Cas9 to go and cut in a particular place is called a guide RNA. You put a guide RNA which will uh, be able to recognize a certain sequence here. Now, because the guide RNA tells the Cas9 cut here, it will cut there and it will copy itself. So from having the gene alter, alteration in one allele, the alteration automatically goes into the other end. And both of them are changed now. Once both of them, both the alleles are changed of the pair of chromosome, this particular, G, this particular drive, as it's called, is going to populate the entire population in a few generations. And now suppose you put something in the allele, which is going to actually kill this cell or kill this uh, organism. So that's going to happen at the fertilization stage, right? The, uh, at, that, at that stage itself, if you can kill, then you can wipe out an entire population. And gene drives have been shown to be highly effective. They, they've been shown, I mean, in, in small populations in laboratories, in, 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 in uh, mosquitoes, in rodents, they've, they've shown that you can kill an entire population. And, and the reason that that's possible is because this is going to is this, this particular gene is going to propagate very, very fast in the population. In a few generations, you can actually cause extinction. And when people do these experiments, uh, they have to be extremely careful that none of the mosquitoes escape from the lab because that one mosquito is actually has, has the power to, to cause extinction uh, in the entire world. So this is, again, you know, if for those of you who are fond of Spider-Man, uh, this is great power and you really need to exercise it with great responsibility. Uh, there have been a lot of concerns about uh, uh, how these experiments have been done by people in their labs. The containment has to be very, very secure. And uh, with CRISPR-Cas, the problem is that it is so easy to do. Any lab can do it uh, without even getting the required consent. Uh, and, and that is the concern with CRISPR-Cas9 right now. <clears throat> All right, let's move over to CRISPR-Cas applications in plants. Uh, you can well imagine that there used to be, uh, earlier when I used to give, give these talks, I used to have a list of plants genome edited. Now, I think I should 
I, I need to have a list of plants which are not genome edited because using CRISPR because uh, almost every plant on earth uh, has been edited in one way or the other. And I'm just going to be showing you a few examples here. Um, this is just a photo which shows how six locusts at a time were changed uh, or six genes at a time were changed in tomato so that the wild tomato could be edited and its size could be increased. You can see that these are much larger than small tomatoes and um, the nutritional value of the fruit could be increased. In plant genome engineering, one concern used to be that uh, it used to be agrobacteria mediated, right? So a lot of foreign gene used to end up in the plant uh, and it used to be the present in several copies. And that was one of the major uh, concerns. But with CRISPR-Cas9, you don't leave behind any scar. You don't leave behind an antibiotic selectable marker. You don't leave behind the DNA coding for Cas9. You just changed some small portion of the genome. And that's far more acceptable to people than having uh, you know, viral and bacterial genes inside the plant. And uh, though I told you earlier that to make a change in the genome, you need to make a double-stranded cut. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm presenting it to you with respect to plants, but you can essentially do it in any organism. You can also make a change without a double-stranded cut. And you can do this using um, proteins called uh, uh, citadine deaminase or adenine deaminase. So what is done is you have the Cas9, but you, you have the dead Cas9, can't cut and you have the gRNA, and now you can send it to a certain region. You fuse this to something called uh, citadine B aminase, which will just change one base to the other. And this is very, very useful when you're trying to make a very small change uh, in the genome, which in turn is going to result in a large change in the phenotype of that organism. And this, uh, therefore, you, if you, if you look, look, look here, a C in the DNA was changed to a T, right? and all without making a double-stranded cut. <clears throat> and this has been done a lot in plants because uh, uh, in, in plants, and if you're trying to make something fit for eating, you don't want to leave behind anything. Uh, and and uh, small changes have, have been converted into large phenotypic changes. For example, this acetolactate synthase gene was edited in tomatoes and wheat using this technology. And you could have enhanced resistance to herbicides. Uh, single, single amino acid substitutions to produce Rice plants with late flowering has been done. There are a whole lot of things that have been done. I'm just giving you a few examples of what has been done. And this particular slide gives you an idea of the number of companies which are making CRISPR cas edited uh, crops. Benson Hill Systems, but early, very early, 2012, 2011 is when programmable Cas9 uh, uh, was sort of discovered. And <clears throat> already in 2012, you had this company which is making gene editing, which is doing gene editing using CRISPR, CPF1. It is doing editing for higher yield, stress resistance, herbicide tolerance. You have this Cotiva, uh, which is again, Dow Chemicals, uh, part of that. And uh, they're making Vaxicon modified for altered starch composition. You have a company called Pairwise, again, disease resistance, increased productivity, more convenient fruits and vegetables, by which they mean something like uh, late ripening or um, no browning of uh, fruits and vegetables. You have Syngenta, which is uh, making CRISPR edited corn, soy, wheat, tomato, sunflower, all for yield, tropic biosciences. So there's a long, long list. It, this is, I think, uh, updated up to 2018, but now you have Impossible Foods. You have a company called Synthego uh, doing, you know, sometimes really wild things, like they're just editing, uh, editing soya bean to taste more like wheat, uh, meat. So they are ha they have it in their burgers and it, it feels and tastes and even bleeds like meat. So uh, some of it makes sense, but some of it really doesn't. Uh, so let's just look at very famous CRISPR plant products. Uh, the, there's a GABA enriched tomato, which is the first CRISPR edited food to enter market. And uh, this was made by a company in Japan called Sanatec. And they, they said it contains high, high amounts of uh, gamma aminobutyric acid, which is uh, good for health. Uh, in UK, they have granted permission to uh, start field trials of wheat with lower levels of aspargine because aspargine, uh, when you bake or when you make bread out of wheat, it uh, gets converted to acrylamide, which is, of course, uh, not, it, it's cancer-causing and not good for health. 
people have made waxy corn which contains higher level of starch uh it is first going to be used as a label additive and to improve the consistency starch is often used to thicken uh, food and therefore more starch more uh, better better properties non browning lettuce right and this has been done by deleting genes for polyphenol oxidases so again these are just fairly early reports and famous reports uh, which came in for plant based food but le le let's look at what the regulation is like for crispr uh the the bottom line is that crispr cas9 and other new gene editing techniques do not require extensive regulation because the resulting plants don't contain dna from plant pests such as viruses and bacteria which i've already told but it is first country to country in us they say that we don't consider genome edited food gmo and they can be cultivated and sold doesn't require any regulation so that's that's the story in the us and brazil argentina and australia have all said yes this is what we believe in china is still establishing a regulatory process for genome editing agricultural organisms but nothing has been really approved so far in the europe genome edited food is considered gmo it is lumped with gmo it is considered that so it has to go through all those protocols and regulations which are required for gmo and uh, they have taken a rather uh, you know hard stance on this but people and scientists have been asking them to uh, rethink the policy there are some countries like south korea who have generated a lot of crispr uh, modified uh, plants like they have made color modified petunias high oleic acid soybeans browning inhibited potatoes but they have not been able to sell anything because the uh, domestic regulatory policy has not yet been drafted and in india it's a similar case we are still drafting the guidelines at least one they, they have put out a draft in 2020 and they've invited scientists to making offer their comments so we still drafting our policy so uh, i think i've spoken for rather long and uh, this is a slide this is your take home message that if you want to make a if you want to make a change in the genome you need to start with making a specific double stranded cut there are three technologies which are available zfn talon and crispr and in zfn and talon they contain specific amino acids and they need to be engineered for recognizing a specific dna sequence but in crispr system you just need to change one guide rna and that's relatively easy to do and that's that's the usp of the crispr system easy to do genome editing allows gene deletions insertion replacements in all living systems and therefore has many 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 applications but we need to be cautious when we are exercising this so i will leave you with this picture which shows you which is a very visual uh, representation of what the crispr can do you have people have made bulkier dogs uh, hornless cattle bigger fish uh, mini pigs and larger rooster you know hen i think yeah so uh, a lot can be done with crispr but yeah we need to be really really careful about how we do it and uh, do it with a with a sense of responsibility um i i hope i've been able to bring you the essence of genome editing and uh, thank you all for listening patiently and i'll be happy to take any questions thank you thank you ma'am for this most illuminating talk i anusuya along with siddhant now open the floor to any questions that the audience may have If you have any inquiries for our esteemed speaker, you may type it in the chat box or raise your hand, and we will unmute you for any such inquiries. The feedback form will be activated after the vote of thanks succeeding this Q and A session. Mm. So, so shall I start addressing the questions from the chat box straight away? No, ma'am. We'll read them out. Okay, fine. Um. to start with asmita has a question inquiring what are the concerns over the safety as technology develops yeah so i i think it might have got addressed uh, along the course of the talk it is a concern safety is a concern and uh, uh, they've had several uh, so 
So one of the first things that was done after the CRISPR-Cas technology was discovered was they had a conference which is called as the Asimolar conference, which is also which also happened several years back when recombinant DNA technology came in, wherein that was what was discovered that uh, there are so many things that can go wrong with this technology, whether it is gene drive, whether it is human therapy, whether it is uh, plant genome editing, there's so many things that can go wrong with this. So they had drafted a lot of regulations and a lot of countries are part of that. And uh, uh, there are safety concerns and one has to be careful about how we use it. Yeah, does oh. that answer question? I think it does. Um, moving on to the uh, next question. Uh, can CRISPR target uh, multiple sites at the same time? Uh, this yeah. question is asked by an LFO. Yeah, it, it, in fact, it can. Uh, and that's, again, one of the uh, uh, advantages of, of using the CRISPR system that you can have multiple gRNA. So every time, so so if you want to target, say, six loci at, a, at the same time, you can have the same Cas9 protein and have six gRNA or the guide RNA uh, supplied simultaneously. And you will have uh, six, uh, it's called multiplexing, right? So you can have multiple sites being changed at the same time. And uh, that's, again, one of the huge advantages of CRISPR. It's, it's so much faster to do. Uh, than say ZFN or talent. So yes, the answer is yes. You can change multiple genes at the same time. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, which diseases are more suitable targets for genome editing? Yeah, so uh, so mostly, you know, place the, the blood disorders. Uh, they can be a little more easily treated simply because what how it's done is you. Mm, uh, you you recover uh, you you take out say for example you take out T cells or B cells or <clears throat> uh, hematopoietic stem cells you edit them in a petri dish and you put it back and you let them divide and uh, uh, populate the blood and therefore uh, even I mean if you, if you look at uh, if you look at the slides that I was showing you it was a blood disorder that was the first to be treated sickle cell disease was the first to be treated using CRISPR Cas technology and yes those will be the ones which will be most easily uh, be treated. Because if you're talking about a solid tumor or, a, or changing a, a mutation which is present all over your body, that's going to be really, really difficult. So blood disorders are going to be the ones that will be first treated using CRISPR technology and easier to treat. So the next question is, uh, while using CRISPR-Cas9 system in vivo, is there any bioinformatics tool which can determine the number of, of yeah? Targeting? There are there are many many bioinformatic tools. In fact, um, there are uh, there's a there's a for example when you're when you're designing your gRNA, there's a software which is called Chop Chop for humans, wherein you can uh, when you're designing your guide RNA, you can uh, get an idea about how good the guide RNA is. What is the chance of off targeting? Uh, what is the chance that this is going to be a very efficient way uh, guide RNA? So there are very, very reliable software tools which are available for both off-target, uh, uh, for both determining the off-target as well as the efficiency of the guide RNA. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, how to screen the edited cells after transfecting the CRISPR-Cas9 vector? Uh, okay. Uh, there are several ways to do it. Um, Depending on how much, uh, so the idea of CRISPR-Cas9 is that the efficiency is so high that you don't need to use a selectable marker, right? Only then, I mean, uh, if you need to use a selectable marker, then you're back to using antibiotics and other things which you don't want to do. So uh, depending on what change you have made, you can either look for a phenotype. There are assays which are called surveyor assays in which you can, uh, uh, you, you can actually, uh, I, I say whether the change that the DNA, the change in the DNA has happened or not happened. Uh, sometimes you use a reporter, but then again, it defeats the purpose because you just want to make a change and come out. You don't want anything to linger. So yeah, there are a lot of ways in which you can, you can actually do it. Uh, but once you have actually seen whether you have made the change that you want to, and depending on what your application is, for example, if you're trying to uh, edit a human cell, it's not only important to see whether you made the change you want to, it's also important to see that you've not made any other change that you didn't want to. 
so it comes down to looking at whether you did what you want to and looking at whether you did something that you didn't want to <coughs> so as if you're doing it in human cell you actually have to do the entire human genome sequence so yeah there are these two thank you um anuj has his hand raised so i'm going to unmute him am i audible ma'am yeah yeah good morning and ma'am it's so wonderful to hear about this genome editing from your side i'm actually as you have mentioned in the your presentation as well that there is a whole lot of that ethical debate is going on with respect to this genome editing and all that and the crispr babies that example that you have mentioned ma'am um, i don't want to get into this uh, hum embryo stuff and all that because there is a whole lot of debate and it's i think ma'am actually i want to know about the plant systems because Uh, when we are using this crispr cas for this plant systems and all that genome editing so how easily it can be accepted by our ecological system because most of the times there is a whole lot of competition between wild and our uh, treated or uh, edited uh, genome edited uh, plants and all that so there is a whole lot of competition and uh, most of the scientists and there is a lobby that uh, told that uh, we are going to have create a threat by ourselves on these ecological systems and uh, and uh, nowadays this covid is all about that the debate that uh, this is also a product of this genome editing and something like the lab leakage or like that so how do these uh, plant systems get accepted easily by uh, with respect to this genome editing hmm. yeah so so see uh, i mean i think we we need to look at it um, um, sort of impartially in that uh, blanketing everything that is genome edited or genetically modified under a label of hazardous is not right uh, as scientists our job is to evaluate uh, experimentally if possible the possible yeah, hazard the of the <laughs> yeah so i said that you need to evaluate whether something is truly hazardous or not the genetically modified organisms the uh, worry or concern was always that they can Uh, parts of a viral genome or a viral bacterial uh, gene with gene uh, with uh, genome modification that change is very small and very very specific and when you make a specific change it's easier to predict the outcome and i think we should take the scientists word on this as the final that if they think that the uh the the risk is small uh and uh that it's worth i mean if it's if it's going to improve the agricultural scene in in any way then we should just take their word for it and accept uh accept it so uh for example uh, it's hard to imagine how um uh, how changing or increasing the uh, starch content of a crop is going to make it um uh, less ecologically fit uh and if if scientists have rigorously tested it and uh, proven that it is not likely to do that then we should i think accept their word uh that it is it is not hazardous and it is but yes the important thing is to address this uh and and be sure that there is no hazard associated but yeah, not but not to yeah. not to uh but but not just brush it aside and say anything that's artificial or edited is is wrong yeah but ma'am uh, to establish something in a lab setup and to do it in the ground setup is uh, i think it's a totally whole lot of different things yeah and uh, but... we can establish a thing and genome editing in a lab setup and then we are going to say that yeah it's good but in the field setup there is might be a it will take some 5 to 10 years to establish or something ascertaining our thoughts and points and concepts that yeah it's factually there so that's my my concern and uh, how to address that yeah so so like i said that if you uh, i mean that these things come with a field trial right so people uh, people don't just do it in the lab and and then and then say it's okay there are field trials which are done uh, one second thing is that uh, there is a lot of genetic diversity that is already available and you're just playing with one gene uh, so so like i said i mean if there are sufficient field trials available if it has been proven uh, to a certain degree and if there is real 
um, value addition to agricultural practices or nutritional content or any such thing. I think we should just take their word for it. Thank you so much for, thank you so much. Ma thank you ma'am for, for that detailed answer. Uh, moving on to the next question, it's from our, uh, one of our YouTube viewers. It is, what is the role of MAM sequences in CRISPR-Cas9 systems and how is the repair template DNA introduced for HDR? Okay, so the, uh, yeah, so the PAM, PAM uh, sequence is a technical point. Um, so, so remember that the uh, virus, uh, that the bacteria just integrates a portion of the DNA of the incoming bacteriophage, right? So it takes a portion of the DNA and integrates into its own CRISPR system. Now there is, when it does this, it picks it up from a region, uh, from, from a particular region of the bacteriophage DNA, wherein there are three bases or more or less, which are invariant. So for example, for Cas9, the sequence is NGG, that is the PAM. And that sequence must be present downstream of the piece of DNA uh, which it is integrating into its genome. Now it's integrating it into the genome, it leaves the PAM, doesn't integrate the PAM into its, its genome. So now you have the, a portion of bacteriophage without the PAM that is present in the genome. When the bacteriophage enters again, the RNA recognizes the DNA based on the presence of PAM. If the PAM were also present in the genome of the E. coli, then it will destroy itself, right? Because now the gRNA will be able to target its own genome, the bacteria's own genome. So PAM is the factor which gives the bacteria self non-self recognition. It tells the bacteria, okay, this is foreign and this is self. So the PAM needs to be present if you're if if you're if you are programming CRISPR-Cas9 to um, target a certain DNA molecule, you need to make sure that that target has a PAM downstream of it. So that is the role of PAM in genome editing. And what was the other part? What is the second half of the question? Oh, the second half says that, uh, how is the repair template of the DNA introduced? Yeah, so this model? repair template is, is very easy to do in a, in a lab setup, in a, in a Petri dish or in a, uh, in a, maybe in a micro injection scenario or when you're trying to build mouse models. So you just, when you're sending in CRISPR-Cas9, you, so you suppose you're sending in the Cas protein with the RNA, suppose you're sending a ribonucleoprotein, you send in the DNA template along with that during electroporation or during microinjection or whatever it is. And the cut and the repair happens simultaneously. But of course, when you're using it for therapy, and nobody's used it for therapy in that sense. But uh, uh, when, when, when people are doing it in the lab, and for example, where even the sickle cell disease was treated, they must have taken the cells, uh, done this uh, editing in a Petri dish and put back the cells once they were sure that the editing is happened properly. So um, that's how you introduce the double strand DNA. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, what is the difference between genome edited plants and genetically modified plants? Are they the same? I, I think I think we covered that during the presentation. That when you say genetically modified, you normally mean that there's a foreign gene in the plant. Uh, but if you take the meaning of GMO literally. Uh, genome edited is also genetically modified, right? You have made a genetic change. But uh, by uh, popularly, it is comprehended that GMO means genetically modified, uh, GMO means a foreign gene and maybe multiple copies of a certain gene that were not present to start with. And genome editing means that you're making a very specific change in that organism in a particular genome. So you're not like introducing a foreign gene. So that's the public, that's the perception that you get when you use the two words, yeah. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Oh, the next question says that, uh, how much can we reduce the off-target effects of genome editing? Like, is there an extent to it? Yeah, so, so um, a lot of effort has gone into research to, to address this point. Um, uh, and it has been done in multiple ways. One is, of course, to improve the guide RNA design 
uh, by using the softwares that 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 I talked about when I was answering one of the earlier questions. Uh, the other is that uh, by using a approach which is called a double Nikkei's approach, which is that uh, if you want to have a double standard cut, you should have been able to. Um, for example, for guide, the Cas9 guide RNA recognizes a stretch of 20 amino acids, uh, 20 bases. Uh, and 20 bases, with 20 bases and 3 billion bases, you have a chance that this 20 bases is present either elsewhere or that there is a partial match present elsewhere because 20 bases is not that large when you think about 3 million bases. So in the double case approach, you need to not just identify 20 bases, you actually need to identify 40 bases for you to get a double stranded cut. And that improves your chance. That improves your chance that you will cut only where you want to cut and not in other places. So um, apart from this, they are looking at Cas9, they're mutating Cas9 proteins in every possible way to bring down the off-target effect. Uh, there are several, several reports of such things happening. And there are at least a couple of papers where you will find the title, no detected, no detectable off-target effects using such and such and such. So when they say not detectable, it may or may not be zero. So yeah, your question that how much can we reduce? Yes, we have already reduced it a lot. Uh, uh, and possibly we've come to zero off target, but in biology, nothing may be 100%. So essentially you have to, once you have done the genome editing, screen very, very thoroughly to see that there are no other effects. And uh, they have had a reasonable success with this. Uh, we have to see just uh, how much that will help us. Yeah, so it has been reduced a lot lot. The off-target effect has been reduced a lot over the years. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, amongst the techniques mentioned, such as ZFN, Talon, CRISPR-9, which is the most efficient one? I mean, obviously, hands down, CRISPR-Cas9, right? Uh, nothing like CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, uh, but again, it, it depends on what you mean by efficiency. Um, Efficiency can mean that the protein itself is very good at making that cut, which CRISPR-Cas9 is. Uh, efficiency can mean that it makes the cut only in one place and nowhere else, which it is. Uh, so, so on both counts, CRISPR-Cas9, uh, CRISPR-Cas systems are better. Uh, but talents are maybe not so bad either, uh, because uh, once you make them, they perform fairly. Uh, so in, in terms of efficiency, maybe talents and CRISPR-Cas don't stand very far from each other, but because it's easier to use CRISPR-Cas9 uh, and, 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 and high throughput uh, methods are possible with CRISPR-Cas, that is the system that is preferred. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is that if we think of sickle cell anemia, won't pre-implementation screening or embryo selection or IVF solve the issue of getting a disease-free embryo and uh, will CRISPR offer something better or is it more efficient? Sorry, second part was what? Uh, will CRISPR offer something better in this respect or, or, or are the uh, mentioned options uh, more efficient? Yeah, two things here. One. Yeah. Are two... I'm here. Uh, so there are two things here. One is that uh, one is that you're using it for therapy, right? So there's a sick person and you want to make that person feel better, in which case it doesn't make sense to go to the embryo. <clears throat> so you just treat that person. The other thing is that you're trying uh, that, that a person who's sickle cell positive is trying to uh, have a child who is not sickle cell positive, in which case that the, the question about embryo comes in where you want to prevent the offspring from carrying the sickle cell disease. Uh, while CRISPR-Cas9 is a very, very good tool to do this, <clears throat> uh, we've already spoken about ethical consideration. And as of now, for the ethical, uh, the ethical right to modify an embryo, can you hear me? Yes, you're audible. Yeah, yeah. I thought, okay. Uh, to, to make that change and um, bring the embryo to, to, to full term. So 
while it's it's a possibility <clears throat> a very real possibility but right now the um, the ethical stand that is being taken by the world is that we don't know enough and we are not going to make crispr edited babies so possible that that's the answer Thank you, ma'am. In uh, conjunction with that question, there's a question here that is, what happened to the babies which were genetically modified for HIV in China? Yeah. The babies were called, <laughs> for this really, <laughs> babies were called Lulu and Nana. We don't have pictures of them, thankfully. Uh, it was not, uh, they are fine, <laughs> they're fine. Um, because whatever it, it is, that protein that was uh, modified is only giving them protection against HIV. Beyond that, there was no other, hopefully there was no other change. So they are fine and they're growing up, but we don't know the uh, long-term effects of not having this protein. So uh, that is where it is, yeah. But yeah, those were the last CRISPR edited babies. We've not had any after that. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Oh, the next question is, what is the probability uh, that off-target genes may be affected? Yeah, I think we've covered this in other answers, right? I mean, the, there is a probability that there could be off-target effects and there have been a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, there are a lot of efforts to reduce the off-target effect. So the off-target effect is very real. And uh, it's possible that there could be an off-target effect of CRISPR editing. But until that problem is solved, I don't think we're going to be doing any CRISPR editing in uh, humans at least. Yeah. But there is a probability. It's a, it's a real chance. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, what are the main constraints of genome editing in livestock? I'm feeling she's getting stuck. Uh, so I guess uh, we could for go forward with the program now, since she has been answering so many questions. If there are more questions, of course, you are welcome to mail us. Uh, Susan, ma'am, should we go forward now? Yeah, the, I thank her once again. Yes. Not yes. only uh, Chitra, the wonderful speaker. I am really proud of you, Chitra. And also uh, Sri and our whole team from uh, our uh, Sophia College. You have always supported him, sir. And, uh, wish you all the best. Please welcome, ma'am. Thank you so much for you know giving us an opportunity year after year to be associated with you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, Asmita, please go forward. Okay, we can... Go thank you, Anusaya and Saddam. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Anusaya and Saddam. I would now like to invite my classmate Naveen for delivering the vote of thanks. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Asmita. I'm Naveen, and I would like to express a profound gratitude to our guest and resource person, Dr. Chitra Mishra, for having accepted our invitation and gracing us with today's seminar. Chitra ma'am, we are extremely thankful for and enlightened with your knowledge and presence. The thing that improved me the most is uh, the pace with which the CRISPR-Cas9 technique is furthering medical biology for the bet betterment of humanity. Thank you for an interesting and thought-provoking talk. Furthermore, I would like to thank our principal, Dr. Sister Ananda Amrit Mahal, for her immense support. This initiative was in collaboration with IVSA, and I would like to extend our gratitude to Dr. Susan Eben and all the IVSA members for their kind presence and support. Additionally, I would like to thank BRNS for sponsoring us and making this marvelous project possible. 
thank you to all the esteemed faculty present here. Lastly, I would like to thank all the students who participated in this event. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, Navin. I would now like to request the audience to kindly fill in the feedback form, the link for which has been posted in the chat box, which will be active after, for the next 30 minutes. Once again, thank you all for your presence today. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I got disconnected. I'm sorry. Uh, you rather, I mean, uh, spoke for a long period, Chitra. I mean, a lot of energy that way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just, I just hope, uh, I just hope it was not too long. No, no, of course not. <laughs> of course not. Thank you so much for coming and delivering the talk. Yeah, it's, it was a pleasure. Thanks so much. Yeah. So now they are filling up the feedback form. Chitra, okay. if you want, you can uh, disconnect to us. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank okay. you once again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We are proud thanks, of you. Thanks, thanks. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chitra.